my great pleasure to introduce one of the most successful investors in the world, Shan Wei Jian. Um, Shan is the CEO of PAG Group, which has $40 billion under management and investments in both the United States and China. He's also the author of two books, Out of the Gobi, which is, is an amazing account of his personal experiences during the Cultural Revolution. I highly recommend it. And a new book uh, called Money Games, the inside story of how American dealmakers saved Korea's most iconic bank. I know that Shan spent many years working on uh, Korea, Korea mergers and acquisitions, et cetera. So um, that's already, I understand, a bestseller. So um, I'm equally delighted that his fireside chat will be moderated by Adi Ignatius, editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review, who also happens to be my husband. So by the way, um, Shan is happy to take a few questions from the audience at the end of the conversation. So please do type your questions into the Q&A box and um, we will uh, get to them at the end. Thanks so much. Over to you, Adi. All right. Thank you, Dinda. This sure sounds like nepotism. But anyway, I'm very, very, very pleased to be here. Uh, and particularly with Shan Wei Jian, who um, is, as Dinda said, one of the most successful and I would add thoughtful people working at the intersection of Chinese, of the Chinese and US business world. And also someone who we knew many, many years ago in Hong Kong. So uh, Sean, it's great to, great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so very much for having me. Good morning. Yeah. So we'll have a conversation for a while. And as Dinda said, we will invite conference attendees to submit questions too. So um, if you'd like to ask Sean anything, please type in your question in the chat box. So let, let's jump right in. Um, there was a lot of talk yesterday about decoupling. It was mostly sort of policy people and analysts uh, uh, really giving their views. And Sean, as an investor on the ground, you know, what is your view on decoupling and how do you see things playing out? Well, there has been a lot of talk about decoupling in the past two years. Not too much has taken place as far as I can tell. So the question in my mind is, what is the purpose of decoupling? If the purpose is to address the trade balance or imbalance, then it doesn't seem that the trade war, which has raged down for the past two years, has achieved any effect at all. In fact, the US trade deficit is at almost all time high. And China's trade surplus is almost at an all-time high. So that has not achieved the stated purpose, that is the trade war has not achieved the stated purpose of reducing the trade deficit for the United States. If the purpose of decoupling is to bring down China, which seems to be the case, I just don't think that uh, it will be very successful. Meanwhile, the effort certainly would hurt both economies, and I think it has already done so, although to a very limited extent. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more specifically then about the damage that, I mean, let's assume decoupling really continues and maybe accelerates. Um, not saying that's inevitable, but it's certainly possible. What would the effect be on China? Um, you know, given that China still remains the most important driver of, of global supply chains, how would, how would China have to adapt? What, what, what damage would this inflict on, on China? Well, in the scheme of things, I think the effect will be quite limited. But it is best to look at this issue from, let's say, an example. The US has imposed sanctions on a number of Chinese technology companies, such as Huawei, CTE for a while, and some other semiconductor related uh, companies. And if you look at the semiconductor sector, the top 10 American chip makers sell about three times in China as they do in the United States. So of course, if America prohibits as it does, these companies to sell to some of the Chinese buyers and the Chinese buyers like Huawei obviously will be hurt. But the suppliers, that is American chip companies, will be adversely affected as well because all of a sudden they lose the largest market 
that they've had uh, almost overnight. So that's why I think this decoupling talk is a double-edged sword. You know, of course you heard, it's like a war, of course. You heard the other side, but you also hurt yourselves. You know, take again trade war as example. I published two pieces in foreign affairs in December last year and January of this year. By my analysis, the cost of the trade war to the United States is about 1% of GDP, which I thought would not be so much felt if the economy was growing at 3% per year. And I was predicting that the effect would be more keenly felt if the economic cycle turns because the next point in the cycle will be a downturn. But I didn't know the economy would drop 9% in the second quarter of this year related to the lockdowns. <laughs> Therefore, 1% is not so much felt anymore. Uh, but the point is that uh, there's a cost on both sides whenever some policies like decoupling or trade war are implemented. So yeah, so basically what you're saying, it's almost a mutually assured destruction that the, the two economies are so linked that to seriously untangle them would do damage to both sides. That's a rational viewpoint. And the question is whether rationality prevails. You know, I remember some years ago, Steve Jobs was talking to Barack Obama and uh, President Obama asked if, the, if Apple could make uh, the iPhone in the US. He said, no, that he needed a supply chain that was mostly in China. You know, this is the type of period where U.S. companies talk about moving their supply chains elsewhere. Can they? Are there alternatives to what China does best? To some extent, yes. Of course, you can make things in Mexico. You can make things in Vietnam, increasingly, in Southeast Asia. So for companies which make very simple products, I think it is possible to move out of China. And it is probably desirable to do so because now the tariff for many of the China imports is about 25%. So it's just too expensive to make them in China and export them to the United States. Vietnam and Mexico would be better places to do so. And in fact, China is going through a hollowing out process as America did in 1980s, you remember that we talked about hollowing out of industries as manufacturing was moved to Japan and then to Southeast Asia, to Taiwan, to Korea. And China is experiencing the same thing because the labor cost has been rising in the past 10 years. China's labor cost on average has increased by about 11% per year. And that's a huge increase year after year. And currency has been strengthening, and therefore the costs of inputs for exports have been rising. But because China is saddled with overcapacity, so the prices of exports to the US market have stayed flat or have fallen. And therefore the profits for exporters have been squeezed thinner and thinner. So it makes sense for them to move their production to Vietnam, to Indonesia, and the Chinese companies are already doing that. And I would think that some American companies would make the move from China to other cheaper countries. On the other hand, you, you raised this example of Apple. It is not so simple to make an iPhone. It's not just one part, it's not just assembly. You will require maybe hundreds of parts, if not thousands of parts from all different suppliers. They are mostly located in China. You can move, but you can't take the entire supply chain, especially owned by the Chinese companies, to wherever you want to move to. And therefore it's not so practical to uh, move you know, many of the production from many of the production sites from China to other countries. So that's one point. The second point is China is increasingly changing from a factory of the world to a market of the world. China's retail market 
has exceeded that of the United States last year, you know, six trillion dollars. 10 years ago, Americans retail goods market was about $4 trillion and China was about $1.8 trillion. Today, China's is about $6 trillion, slightly larger than the United States. So General Motors, for example, GM sells more cars in China than the United States, Mexico and Canada combined. So you ask GM to move out of China well, they lose their biggest market. It doesn't make sense. You know, Starbucks gets 20% of its revenue from China. Where does it move to? If it moves away, it just loses the entire market. Um, so I want to talk about coronavirus and the global economy. You know, China is maybe several steps ahead of the U.S. and other industrial, and some other industrialized companies, uh, countries. Um, in the sort of post-pandemic moment, you know, do you, do you see that this is a moment where China can essentially lead the world out of recession because of where it is on the post-pandemic curve? China itself has come out of the recession. China itself has largely recovered. In the first quarter of this year, the Chinese GDP dropped by 6.8%. In the second quarter, it rose 3.2% year over year, over the same period last year. In the third quarter, the number has not come out as yet, but the street consensus is 5.2% over the same period of last year. In the United States, in the second quarter, the economy dropped by about 9% year over year. So back in March, or actually back in February, I was predicting in some publications that China would be the first to come out of the lockdown because it was the first to go in. And America and Europe probably will follow China by a quarter or two. But it appears that the virus is completely under control in China. It's largely eliminated. So life has come back to normal, but in America and in Europe, it's still difficult to tell when, you know, the clear signal will be issued. So this time around, America in particular and in Europe have adopted much stronger stimulus packages than China did. China hardly did anything. So I don't think that China will be able to lead the world out of the recession. I saw some analysis just last week to suggest that probably by the end of next year, the US economy will return to the same level of 2019, that is the end of 2019 before COVID. And China will be about 10% higher than 2019. And if you look at the numbers that we have seen, that prediction seemed to be more or less on track. Um, so, so as China continues to strengthen, um, I'd be interested in, you know, what investment opportunities you're seeing um, in China, maybe maybe new ones, and what what sectors are you are you betting on? Well, since about ten years ago. We as an investment firm have decided or decided at that time not to invest in any export related sectors for reasons I just described. You know, the input costs are rising, export prices have been flat, profit is squeezed very thin. And we see that China is shifting its growth model away from investment led growth, which has created so much overcapacity to a more consumption driven growth. And if you look at consumption and its role in Chinese economy, it's exceedingly small. In the United States, private consumption accounts for about 68% of the GDP. The world average is about 62%. For China, five years ago, private consumption accounted for about 35% of GDP. Last year, it has increased 
to 39% of GDP, but still just about half that of the United States. So China knows, or they have known this for the past 10 years or more, that the investment driven growth model is not sustainable because China's savings rate is going to drop and drop precipitously with the aging of the population. And therefore they have to shift away from that model in the direction of a consumption driven growth. And that's why private consumption has increased from, from 35% of GDP to 39%. So that's where the growth is. I already talked about the increase in the size of China's retail goods markets in the past few years. So we invest in businesses which cater to private consumption in China because that's where the growth is and that's where the future is. That's great. I, you know, I can see, I think I can see that there are questions that have come in and um, looks like there are several. So, so maybe I'll hand over to Nina who can um, raise the first one. Yeah, we have a question from Darren Chen. Um, he is also one of China Institute's next generation leaders. Um, so Mr. Shen, how do you see the buyout markets developing in China and in Southeast Asia over the next few years as China continues to push financial reforms? China has been the biggest buyout markets in the past 10 years. It's very active in that regard. You see, China is the largest economy in Asia now about three times as big as Japan. Interestingly, I came to Hong Kong about 27 years ago. At that time, the Japanese market or the Japanese GDP was about 10 times that of China. And today is one third that of China. In 30 years, the Chinese economy has grown about 36 times. You know, since 1990. And the mentality of private businessmen in China is very different from that of many countries, especially if you compare with that of Japan. You know, in Japan, people take pride of keeping a business in the family for generations. You know, many Japanese companies are hundreds of years old. I read a book about oldest Japanese companies. Some are more than 1,000 years old. And they would like to keep everything within the family. They don't want to work with outside capital. They're very reluctant to work with foreign capital in particular. But in China, the name of the game is scale. If you can't scale up, if you can't become a national business, then you're not much of a player. So every Chinese entrepreneur wants to scale up their business. And China has developed to such a stage that if a business model is successful, works, then you can replicate it very quickly throughout the country to become a nationwide company. You know, we invested in a company called China Music Corporation about five years ago with about $100 million actually less than that amount. And today it has morphed into Tencent Music Entertainment with 800 million active, active monthly users with a market cap of about $25 billion, just in about five years. Because the business model was successful and it quickly became a national monopoly, if you will. So every businessman would like to work with outside capital to the extent they can scale up their business. And that's why China has been the largest by the market in Asia for the past 10 years. Southeast Asia is promising, but if you want to find investment opportunities exceeding $100 million, which is the minimum for us per deal, is exceedingly difficult. And in China, if you want to deploy a billion dollars in the deal, it is possible to do so. Last year, the PE part of our business, you know, PAG has three businesses, real estate, actual return, and PE buyout. 
just the buyout part of business, we invested more than $2 billion in China alone last year. And of course, we're Asia uh, focused, and therefore we invest in Australia, in India, in Japan, Korea, in Southeast Asia. But China absorbs more of the capital uh, from us than the rest of Asia combined. Okay, next question. Wanna... Another, yes, yeah. next question from um, Hao Wang. As one of the biggest investors exposed to US and China, how would you position either sector or asset class wise in the medium term and the long term amidst uh, the increasing global uncertainty in geopolitics, COVID, etc.? Well, I think I already talked about the not investing in the export sector, and that's for China. This tension between the two countries, of course, have proved us right, although we didn't predict it. And in China, we don't invest in the export sector. And in India, we only invest in the export sector. The reason for that is, in India, the inflation rate is quite high. The currency is rather weak. That is, the Indian rupee is rather weak. So if the rupee devaluates by let's say 20% in the year, which happened before. And then of course you wipe out 20% of your investment immediately without doing anything. But if you are an outsourcing company, let's say selling IT services to America and Europe, then you receive hard currency as revenue and then your cost is in rupee because all your labor is in India a devaluation would only help you. And that's why in India, our strategy is completely different from that of China. So in different markets, you would uh, do it uh, very differently. And uh, it's really just case by case, we underwrite the macroeconomic conditions to decide whether we should focus on consumption related uh, uh, sectors or export related sectors, depending on which market you're operating. Did, did I answer that question? I think so. Um, we have another question from Jody Shu Klai with South China Morning Post. Can Mr. Shen talk about whether he has seen the trade war and the decoupling attempts um, have helped Americans manufacturing jobs? No, not at all. I'm not aware of any meaningful return of American manufacturing to the United States from China. What I have seen is some relocation from China to Mexico in Vietnam. And that is why if you look at American trade deficit, it has not improved. In fact, it has worsened. So I think this rhetoric or even all the policies designed to correct the imbalance are not achieving their effects for a very good reason. As I, I uh, analyzed in my foreign affairs articles last year and earlier this year, trade deficit is a function of domestic consumption exceeding domestic production. And that's what's happening in the United States for the past 20 years, right? actually since 1970s. So that difference is about 3%. And if it's not China, it's somewhere else that you will have to import. And this year, the trade deficit has ballooned. The reason is domestic production has decreased much more than domestic consumption. Domestic consumption has stayed more or less stable thanks to these stimulus packages passed by the Congress and adopted by the Fed. So let's say if domestic production drops 10%, if domestic consumption drops say 2%, then the gap between the two has just increased 8%. That translates into trade deficit. And that is why regardless of tariffs, regardless of trade war, regardless of the talk of decoupling, the trade deficit is now coming down. In fact, trade wars and decoupling would only increase the costs for American consumers. And the reason I say that trade war will cost American consumers about 1% of GDP per year is because 
the terms of a trade, that is the prices of Chinese exports to the United States last year have not changed at all. and have actually slightly increased, meaning all the tariffs are borne and absorbed by American consumers. So it has worsened the trade deficit situation, worsened the conditions of American consumers. And it's all those measures of decoupling and trade war have not achieved the stated effects. Great. Uh, we have received so many questions for you, Mr. Shan, but we only have time for one more. Uh, this question is from Dennis Simon, who is also a speaker um, at the summit. Uh, what is Dennis, your... Dennis Simon, who used to be with, uh, I think, MIT, right? Uh, I, think I know it's... Dennis Simon, yes. Okay. Uh, what is your sense of the Chinese semiconductor industry and its future? Its growth is so critical to China's success in the world of AI, quantum computing, smart devices, etc. I think in the next uh, five to 10 years, if America continues to follow through with these sanctions on technology companies, especially in the semiconductor industry that would hold back China in the semiconductor industry in almost all tech industries which are dependent on semiconductors. But I think in the long run, in 10, 20 years, China has developed to such a stage that there's almost nothing it cannot reinvent. It can reinvent the wheel and therefore eventually I think that shouldn't be a constraint on China's growth. And th that is my view. Okay, back to you, Adi. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm gonna ask one more quick question because we're, we're almost out of time. Um, um, but uh, Sean, this has been, uh, this has been great. Um, but this is a question really about China's policy of opening up and reform. As Vice Minister Zhu Guangyao pointed out, that is still very much the policy the stated policy, yet I think the international business community still complains there are indirect barriers that make the playing field seem uneven. The state-backed sectors have an advantage. So I guess my question to you is, what more do you think China could do in terms of opening up and leveling out the playing field, both for you know, its own private sector and for the international community? I have been investing in China for the past 20 years. I've been investing in America for the past 20 years. But in the first 12 years in my investment career, I was a partner at TPG, whose franchise in Asia used to be called Newbridge Capital. And my new book, Money Games, describes one of the deals that I did in Newbridge Capital, i.e. TPG. So as an American investor, our experience tells us there's almost nothing that we couldn't invest in in China. You know, we took control of nationwide bank in China back in 2004. And we invested about $150 million. And we eventually realized $2.4 billion from that investment is hugely successful. And we were able, as American investor, control a nationwide bank in China. There are many sectors which are restricted to foreign investments, particularly e-commerce. However, there's a, such a thing, I think many of you are familiar, called VIE, or Variable Instrument uh, something, entities, which means that you can get around of those restrictions with this particular structure. Alibaba uses this structure, Tencent uses this structure, Meituan uses this structure. Almost every major technology e-commerce company uses this structure to allow foreign investors to be the majority of the shareholding of all these major companies. So I have not found it so difficult as an American investor to invest in China. There are always ways to get around of it. Having said that, of course, in the financial sector, and now China is opening up very quickly as America is closing up very quickly. For example, JP Morgan now can own 100% of their venture in China as Goldman, as Morgan Stanley. America used to be more open 
than China. But today, to the Chinese investors, we're not. We're international. Most of our capital comes from America. But to most Chinese investors, America is closed. You, know, you can't invest in any technology companies. You can't invest in any financial in institutions. So it is a myth that China is a very close market for investors, in my view. Although as a foreign investor, we just hope that the market opens up more and more. So, uh, Xiaomi Jen, Jian, I want to thank you for, for uh, your insights. Um, I wish we had more time. There were a lot more questions. I just want to say you're, you're too polite to push it yourself, but I really urge um, our attendees to, to, if you want more Xiaomi Jen, Jian, read his books, Out of the Gobi, and the book that I think is just published in the last day or two, Money Thanks, Games, man. the inside story of how American dealmakers saved Korea's most iconic bank. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. Um, Shan, I wish, first I wish I had been on that China Music Corp deal. That sounds like an amazing one. <laughs> and secondly, I love the fact that you said that, you know, companies can always get around restrictions by using, you mentioned VIE, but there's something very profound about that, the sense of being able to get around things and make things happen in China. So just don't you. report me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that conversation it was fascinating and great to hear that despite the current negative news there are still opportunities out there so thank you very much